The good news that we have to proclaim tells us that we have new life entirely by grace and through our faith. That there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, but that we entirely rely on the work that God has done through Jesus Christ. But of course that doesn't mean that all we have to do now is to sit and wait for Jesus to come again. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that we practically do to draw closer to God. Because God calls us to grow as Christians. What new life in Christ does is that it brings us into a living relationship with God. But it brings us to the start of that relationship. A relationship which should grow and mature and actually go on forever. We're also told in the Bible that the key to that relationship with God, the way in which it works, is through prayer. It's through prayer that we speak to God. It's through prayer that we relate to God. It's through prayer that our relationship with God deepens and becomes mature. And all those things are are fairly obvious from the reading of the Bible. The trouble is that most of us would say that we struggle with prayer and with deepening our relationship with God. We see or read about some Christians who seem to get all their prayers answered. There seems to be something about the way that they pray that we're somehow not doing and missing out on. And try as we might, we never seem to get there. We always seem to fall into the trap of kind of do things so that we can get saved again somehow. And we get it wrong. So how do we get into this place of prayer being something more natural to us rather than something which is a chore and which we never seem to get on top of. And why does that story from Mark give us a clue? Well, that's what I want to think about for a few minutes. If we'd read that story in its context in the Gospel, what's just happened is that Jesus has been up a mountain with Peter, James and John, his three closest friends. And while he's been on top of this mountain, in a way that we don't entirely understand, all the glory and wonder of heaven has descended on him. And for a few moments, he stands there, we're told, with Moses and Elijah, these two great figures representing the law and the prophets of Israel talking with them about what he's going to do. And that Peter, James and John, these three unsuspecting disciples, are just left open-mouthed at this amazing experience, which actually Jesus has to say to them, don't tell anybody about this. And after a few moments, it's gone. And Jesus is there, and it's all as it was. And they've had this wonderful, wonderful experience of being in the immediate presence of God in a way that we can scarcely imagine. And then Jesus and Peter, James and John walk down the mountain to where they've left the other disciples and what they find is frankly a bit of a mess. They hear loud arguments going on between the teachers of the law and a group of people. They find these other disciples involved in this this argument. And there's probably a lot of noise, and it's not, not the same as that great experience up the mountain. 
What's happened is that a desperate father has brought his son, who is troubled by demons, to the disciples. They've been sent out by Jesus to cast evil spirits out of people. They've been doing that. And so this desperate man comes along to these disciples and says, my son is troubled by spirits. I'd like you to cast these demon, this demon out of him. He can't speak because of it. It's very troublesome. And the disciples had doubtless prayed over this boy, but nothing happened. And of course, Jesus isn't there to turn to at that moment. And the teachers of the law come up and they say to the disciples something like, there you are, I told you so, it doesn't work. You know, you aren't following the law as you should be doing. No wonder nothing happens. And so the disciples start to argue with the teachers. Well, we're only doing what Jesus said. In the meantime, nothing's happening for this father and his boy. The situation hasn't changed. But it's an interesting question, isn't it? Jesus had sent these disciples out to cast demons out of people. Why couldn't they do it? Because they'd done it before. Suddenly, it stopped working. Had God gone on holiday or gone on sabbatical? Were they doing it wrong? What was wrong with their prayers? Why didn't God act now? And they're so troubled by it. I won't tell you the story because you've heard it. You know what happens. Jesus takes over and he casts the demon out. And they say to him, Jesus, we've done it before. Why couldn't we do it? And he says, well, this sort only come out with prayer. Well, what does he mean by that? Because they had prayed. I think we have to accept that <coughs> there are different sorts of demons. And I think my experience has told me that that's true. When I've been involved in that kind of ministry, sometimes they've <laughs> left it straight away. And at other times, I just don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't seem to work. There are some forms of, 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 uh, of demonization which are very pernicious and which don't seem, to, uh, don't, don't seem to, to respond to prayers sometimes. But also, I think Jesus is saying that there's something different about the way that some people pray. And perhaps I can explain this best by giving you an illustration If I, were to, um, <clears throat> if I were to tell you that I was going to run the London Marathon, you wouldn't believe me. You all know how unfit I am. <clears throat> now, if I then had a conversation with Mike Moss, who's a very fit runner, as you know, he would say to me, well it actually wouldn't be impossible for you to run the London Marathon, but probably not this year. You would have to start doing some training, and you would have to train in a particular way. And you would have to run short distances and get used to that. Is this right, by the way? I'm looking at more fit people. All right. I have asked. Uh, I have asked. So... And you'd have to do probably a half marathon first, and go up to that and work your way up. So that eventually you reach a level of fitness whereby you could achieve a marathon. It's because you've applied a certain kind of training regime to your life which is probably quite costly in terms of time and effort, 
so that you bring yourself to a place where you can do something which at one point you couldn't do. You know, running a hundred yards is probably something I could do, yeah. I'd be worn out. All right, but 26 miles, no way. Can't do it. Now, perhaps what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples in this case is a little bit like that. Dealing with a demon like that is like having the fitness to run a marathon. It depends on a lot of things, and particularly, I would suggest, on the holiness of your life. The worst demons in hell, you see, were scared of Jesus because they knew that they couldn't handle the holiness of that man's life. So, there is a place that you can come to in prayer, which means that you can handle almost anything. Where you come to a point of having such a deep relationship with God <coughs> that even a demon like this can't resist you. And the good news is, and it is good news, that God calls us all into that kind of relationship with him. But we aren't going to get there overnight. We have to be committed to doing that, as I would have to be committed to running the London Marathon. And it might well involve substantial and quite costly changes in the way that you live in order to get there. Now, I think that there are some Christians who make the mistake of thinking that... As their life goes on, the more straightforward the Christian life gets. I would like to reassure you that this is not the case. And that some of you who are smiling at me now also know that that is true. That here you have a story of disciples who, when they were first called to follow Jesus, were sent out to preach the gospel and heal the sick and cast out demons. And they came back to Jesus and said, Jesus, it's amazing. Even the demons leave when we tell them to in your name. And then, a few months later, they encounter this demon and it doesn't move. Why? Well, because Jesus was challenging them to grow in their relationship with God and to grow to a place where they could handle anything. But it involved a little bit more than just saying a quick prayer over a demonized person. It involved the deepening of their relationship with God to a place where they could take on the tough cases. And as we grow in Christ and we become aware of things like spiritual warfare and the fact that, you know, actually it's not always easy to serve, as easy to serve God as it is when we're in church, we start to find that from time to time we come up against situations which seem like a brick wall where we pray about something and nothing seems to move. And so we come across that challenge. The Christian life does not become more straightforward as life goes on. If anything, it's likely to become more difficult because God is challenging us to grow in our relationship with him. At the same time, we must acknowledge that the power of God does not change. God was still more than capable of dealing with this demon in the story. And Jesus was able to prove that. You know, we, <clears throat> when we start hitting difficulties, the question we start asking is that one about, has God gone on sabbatical? You know, is God not with me anymore? Well, actually, yes, he is. But maybe he's trying to teach you something new, which is going to bring you to a much closer place of relationship with him. 
I wonder whether there aren't rather a lot of Christians who have been left muddled and confused by their life experience. Because following God has seemed okay for a while. There's been some really good stuff going on, but now, or then, you know, we've met with something that we can't apparently handle. We've prayed about this, but God doesn't seem to be acting. And, you know, when I was a young Christian, this stuff was all right. But now it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Perhaps, you know, perhaps God doesn't love me anymore. And we start making these connections which are not true. Jesus had not stopped loving those disciples. He hadn't stopped wanting to be with them. He just set them a challenge that they needed to learn to rise to. And there are lots of challenges in life which we we need to rise to as well, which will depend on us developing prayer in ways which will draw us closer to God. And so I'd want to make this suggestion. Prayer does not work by formulas. Some people say that, actually. You know, they say that if you use this formula when you pray for a sick person, they'll get healed. That's rubbish, okay? It doesn't work like that. There are no formulas in the ministry of Jesus, even if someone tells you that there are. And you don't see them in the life of the early church either. And so we don't work by method or anything like that. There there is no formula that's going to get you there quickly. What it depends on is developing our relationship with God. And if I was going to define prayer, that's what I would say it is. Learning about how to deepen our relationship with God, the conduct, if you like, of our relationship with God. And anything that works for you in that relationship, I would suggest that you stick to and develop. We don't all pray the same way. We don't all get the same thing out of different sorts of prayer. And that's fine, because people are different. What works for you, stick with it and develop it. Don't just go on to other stuff, because other Christians say that it's wonderful. Stick with what seems to work for you, and allow that to grow, and use those methods to draw closer to God. You might find that some of the other methods as well begin to make sense as you do that and as you get closer to Jesus and to God the Father. And that as your relationship with God develops, you'll begin to lead a life of greater holiness. And when the challenges come along, don't just suddenly think, oh, you know, maybe God isn't with me anymore or this never works. You know, it may just be that God is is asking you to address something in a different kind of way or to learn something new. Because the things that don't work for us sometimes move when other people pray. That's why we need other people. So, let's not hear the words of Jesus in this story as condemnation. I think what Jesus says in this story is provoked by the fact that you know, he was aware at, the mo- at that particular moment of just what uh, a serious path he was facing on his way to Jerusalem and on his way to the cross. It's not <clears throat> it, the path for us is also costly. It probably will involve changes in the way that we lead our lives in order that we can devote time to the relationship that really matters and will count in the end. But if we feel muddled or puzzled, well, a lot of people have been there before, including the disciples of Jesus. They overcame it. They came to a place where God could actually build the whole of the church on the foundation of those people. The kind of relationship which Jesus called them to is a relationship that is open to all of us in the same way as if you do the right things, you can get to the end of the London Marathon. 
Let's pray that we won't just stop because we think we've gone far enough, but that we continue to grow towards the heart of our Father God.